then you have different F50. It, it didn't work, but it's a high school project. So. That's kind of cool. <laughs> Was this in Novosad? You went to high school in Novosad? Yes. Actually, I was working at, at home alone. So, but, uh, but I, I saw, I heard for neural networks in some high school science center for high school kids. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to. I have to remember to start recording. I'll do that first. Okay, hold on. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. People are still coming in here, but I think uh, we have quorum. Uh, so the, uh, I'm going to take a moment to introduce our, our speaker. Uh, we have uh, Stanislav Mircic. Uh, he's a longtime um, Backyard Brains contributor, uh, back from our early days of our company. Uh, and a brief look at his career trajectory will give you uh, some insight into why he's the most valuable asset within our organization for technical expertise and not only in software development which we was originally hired for but also in hardware development where he has time and again developed solutions in a single day that has stumped myself and the rest of our uh, hardware development team for weeks and he uh, helps us plebeian engineers with a gentle and constructive hand always trying to teach and so uh, today's talk is much about this line of thinking. Um, having noticed the struggles we are having uh, or will soon face with a lot of our projects with neural networks, uh, especially when we're getting to that, that portion of our tiny ML where we're starting to move into these neural networks, uh, he's noticed this looming demise and he's kindly reached out. Uh, he asked if he could prepare a talk uh, to make using neural networks a little bit more intuitive. And so uh, Stanislav has a rich academic background. Uh, uh, he makes um, for a, a very suitable line of research. He has not one, uh, he has started not one, but two PhDs. Uh, in Italy, uh, he originally worked with live neural networks by growing neurons on a, on a dish with a matrix of electrodes underneath it, uh, but then switched to his PhD to looking at the motor cortex uh, and the function there. Then moved back to Serbia and did a, uh, started a PhD in the biomedical engineering to use neural networks to estimate uh, plaques and arteries. and. Uh, much like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, uh, Stanislav saw the opportunity of doing something by himself uh, that be a bit more rewarding than being in academia. So he dropped out uh, and started a company called Unit in Serbia, which is where we were lucky to find him. Uh, so uh, Stanislav combines his incredible technical knowledge uh, learned with his uh, degree at the University of Novi Sad uh, and his passion for biomedical and neuroscience research and with his unlimited supply of patience uh, to provide us a talk entitled Building Intuitions uh, of Neural Networks. And with that, I'm proud to hand the presentation over to our dear friend and colleague, uh, Stanislav Mircic. So take it away, Stan. Yeah, thank you Greg, for these kind words. Uh, I'm very glad that we have a lot of people today. I will try today to explain a little bit uh, of theory of neural networks. And I will. I have ambition to explain how neural networks are trained. We will see about that. And uh, I, I will present uh, and I will give you some insight about some practicalities about neural networks, how to think about data set, how to think about input space, error space, etc. So let's start. Uh, let me just figure out how to move this. Okay. Let's uh, let's start with the. Uh, with the basic things, structure and function of neural network. So we can think about neural ne network as a black box and what is actually functional neural network. So it will take some uh, vector of inputs or some set of 
data and it will map to another set of data. And that's actually in mathematics that we have that for a thousand years and maybe more. And we call that function. And what's the difference between a function and a neural network? So in mathematics, we derive function on the paper with pencil. And uh, with neural networks, uh, we figure out how to derive the function from data. And that's the main difference. So if we look into the neural network, we can see that there are inside uh, that black box, there are a bunch of neurons interconnected, connected to inputs and to output. And uh, that structure is something that we define in advance. When we start working with the neural network, we define how many inputs the neural network will have, so how many outputs, uh, how many neurons, what will be the connection between neurons, how we arrange them in the layers. And uh, we will decide or we will make a decision about uh, types of neurons that we will use. The only job of the training is to figure out the strength of connection between neurons, the actual weights uh, of the neuron. So uh, let's see what one neuron, what's the function of one neuron. So neuron has inputs. Here we have a simple neuron with two inputs, x1 and x2. It will multiply those inputs with the corresponding weights. It will sum up uh, those multiplications, add some bias, uh, which is one constant. And then it will check that sum. And if that sum, for example, in this hard limit neuron, if that sum is greater than zero, it will output one. If it is less than zero, it will output zero. So we have that nonlinear function. So there are different kinds of neurons. All of them have the same sum. Always we have inputs multiplied by weights, and uh, we sum that. And at the end, we do some nonlinear function. If, if for example, for this rel uh, rectifier linear unit, a neuron that's very popular today, uh, we just make that sum. And if it is greater than zero, we output to that sum on output. If it is not, we output zero. And that's it. So there are multiple different activation functions. The list is very long, but uh, let's not talk about that. Let's talk about what is actually neuron doing to its input graphically, somehow to represent that so that you can visualize that. So if we create input space uh, from these two inputs, we have input X1 and X2. Those are the inputs that we feed to neural network. If we create input space and plot X1 on one axis, X2 on another axis, what a neuron is actually doing is just cutting through that space, input space, and dividing the space in a two parts. One part on which neuron is active and other part where neuron is not active. And you can change that line where that line goes through the input space by changing weights and biases. So you will, that's the basically the simplest, uh, simplest function of the neuron in the graphical space. It just cuts through the space and divide it into two halves. So it's very easy to represent that for a hard limit neuron. It's a, a little bit different for the relo neurons and other neurons, but basically all of them are just dividing input space into two halves. Uh, our goal is to divide them in such a way that we discriminate between uh, two, uh, two classes of our data if we are doing classification problem. And if we have multiple inputs, that space is compli more complicated. For example, for three inputs, you have three dimensions of the input space, and you can position your data in that input space. And what neuron does, it just cuts through that space again with the one plane and divide the space in, a, in the two parts. If we have four uh, dimensions on inputs, we have a uh, neuron will be hyper uh, hyper plane that cuts through the space and divides space to the two parts. Okay, so that's what neuron is doing to the input space. And that's very important to visualize that because later in practice, you will think about input space, 
how your data is looking in the e space, how your clusters are looking in the e space, and how many neurons you will need to fence those clusters around to divide the space, etc. So, so let's first define some toy problem that we will use uh, during this presentation. So we can we can define one classification problem. So let's say detection of the dangerous heart rate if we are biomedical biomedical okay, students. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Please interrupt me at any point. Yeah. Um. Can you go back two slides? Yes. Uh, one. One. Yeah. That. That one. That one. Um. Okay. Um. So the or actually one more back. Uh. The the two halves of the space that we're seeing there. Yeah. Do those correspond to the two possible outputs of the neuron? So is it like yes. one half is a one and one half is a zero? Yes. So in uh, okay. one side, one side of the of this line, output of the neuron will be one. For example, if, if we have cut limit neuron, it will be one, and on the other side, it will be zero. If we okay. have a relay neuron, if we have a relay neuron that has, yeah, different outputs, uh, then the on one side of that line, the output will slowly increase, and on the other side, it will be zero. So, for example. If we have a relevant neuron, and, and that's basically it. So the, the that line is completely defined with the with the weights and bias, and you can see here that when you change weight, for example, the, the that line is rotating. When you change bias, that line is shifting up and down. So, and the point is to change weight and biases so that it it does something useful for you to divide the space in a useful way okay so is there any other question or no. okay so uh, let's define the problem. so we have classification problem we have to detect for example uh dangerous heart rate so older people cannot tolerate uh very uh the high heart rate the younger people can tolerate a much higher heart rate and if we have some problem, for example, that uh, we will be given age and a heart rate, and we should uh, we should just output or the output of our neural network should be if that heart rate is dangerous for that person or not. That's a simple classification problem. Um, Besides classification problems, uh, neural network can do function approximation problems. So if we make this problem a little bit more complicated, so that we uh, for the same age and a heart rate, we don't just say it's dangerous or not, but we say how dangerous dangerous it is. If we are trying to hit specific number, let's say 30, let's say that 100 is the most dangerous and a zero is not dangerous, and our fun, our neural network needs to, for, for a certain age and a certain heart rate, needs to output exactly the specific number how dangerous is the heart rate of course we will get that from expert let's say that's a functional approximation because it's not just classifying in two classes but it's actually trying to figure out the exact number so it's some function of the age and heart rate uh, in order to solve that we said that we first need to define a structure of neural network and let's make uh, the simplest neural network possible. Let's uh, let's make a neural network with one neuron because we will be able to demonstrate lots of things just with the one neuron. And uh, that neural network has two inputs, it has one output, and one neuron, a real neuron. How we will use that? We will put a heart rate and age at the inputs, and we will demand from a neural network or from this neuron to output actually how dangerous is heart rate. How we will train this neuron? So we can, we first have to collect a bunch of examples of the age, heart rate, and actual how, how uh, dangerous is that heart rate from expert, and we will present uh, that neuron with uh, with those examples. So we will present them with the age of heart rate on input, and we will demand certain output or a certain output value on the output of the neuron. And uh, 
the question is how how neural network is changing parameters, weights, and biases when we present those examples. So I'll try to explain it now. So if we if we present uh, let's say just one example at first to the neuron and let's say that we have 150 bits per minute heart rate and 80 years is old subject and then neural network is doing its thing so it's multiplying the input with the weight and another input with another weight sum that up at this constant bias and it outputs some value in this case it's a value of 16 let's say but the correct value is 70. now we can calculate error all that for that particular example and error is just we subtract correct value from the value that neural network output and a value in this case is um, error is 54. what does that mean not much now but what we can do is in order to minimize that error is to change the weights and the biases this, that's the only thing that we can change in neural network weights and biases so we can try with one weight and we can systematically change to a bunch of different values and maybe even plot a graph of the error depending on the weight and you can see that for some values of the weight the error will be very high and for some values will be even zero so we will not have any error we will hit the exact value and the question is because at the beginning we randomly assign these weights to neural network how to go from this point uh, where we have some big error to this point where we uh, where we have error of zero and because you can do that for many many examples and uh, you can sum that up and see what's the average error for example on your data set it's not very useful to use this simple equation for the error so it's just sometimes it's positive sometimes it's negative if you sum them up for your whole training set then you can get even zero even though you have a big error so that's why usually people use this quadratic error it's uh, uh, it's a function that that's very similar to normal error just squared so that's always positive and you can see that function how it looks like and that's the actually error space of the of the neural network and whole training is is happening inside uh, this error space regarding to that function so you will start from one point in that uh, error function and will try to figure out how to go to some different place where your error is zero and it would be cool if we can just if we appear here in the error function just to slide out somehow to the minimum of this error function change the weights to slide down to the minimum of this error function and we can look at the at, at the slope of this error function uh, we can look at every point and check what's the slope of this error function that's called gradient and we can check if slope is negative then we have to increase weight if slope is positive then we have to decrease weight to end up in a in a region where the error is small so basically what we need to do is to add negative slope to the weight and that's the that's the point of, of the of the thing but the problem is that we don't have that error function we cannot possibly test for all the different combination of weights and draw that error function so the question is how we will figure out because we have only one weight we we put the input in the neural network and we get the output and we have just one error we don't know in or to to which side to, to, to increase the weight or decrease it would be cool if we have something that will tell us we propose some change of weight and it will tell us how much the error will change when we when we apply this change of weight and 
that would be super cool if we have something that we can multiply with a, with a, with a cha proposed change of weight and to get the error. And that's easy actually to find if you just take this cloud equation divide by uh, change of weight, you, you will get that this, this coefficient, that slope, that gradient is actually a uh, change of, uh, of error divided by change of weight. That's called derivative in mathematics. And we know how to, how to do the derivative of the, of the error function because we know error function, derivative or error function is high school, uh, high school mathematics. And we can get actually that number, that slope. And then if we have slope, we can know in which direction to, to go. And this is derivative. I just put that for completeness. I don't want to torture you with the derivative. But the point is, if you take the error function, you will end up with a derivative, with, a, with some uh, function, and you know all the, all the parts of that function. You know what's the correct value. You know what's the output of your neural network, and you know what's the input. And you can basically, just from one example, you can, you can figure out in which direction you need to change the weights in order to, to minimize the error. So that's, that's the plan. So we have all the weight of neural network. Uh, we uh, subtract slope, or we go opposite direction of slope, and slowly, uh, one step at a time, we will end up in a in a minimal the error function. We will minimize the the error of the of the function. So that's it. But the problem is that that error function can be complicated, and it can have local minima. And if you appear at some place in that error function, uh, you can end up, if you slide down, you can end up with some local minima. That will not be the global minima that you want to achieve. So you will end up in suboptimal sub uh, solution for the neural network. So your neural network will still have some error. Um, and it, it can be big error and your, your, uh, your procedure for uh, for minimizing your error is cannot help you. So that's why sometimes they add some kind of inertia or momentum to the to the change of the weights so that you can jump over those local minimums and different things. So and if, if you that was error function just for one weight. When you change one weight, what will change in error? If you plot that error function for, for multiple weights it can get uh, very complicated. If you, if you have a huge neural network with a lot of ways that can change, then that error space is very complicated, can be very complicated. And then the chances of you stacking up in a local minimum will be very high. Um, the point is how to create training set, how to create quality training set that will enable us to get a quality result out of the neural network. So the best training set would be to have all the possible combination of inputs and to cover the input space completely. And then your neural network will surely uh, figure out how to divide that input space in a two half in a, in, a, in a good way. But we don't have infinite amount of data. We cannot collect data for every possible scenario. So we usually end up with a small amount of data or a much less amount of data. And uh, the quality of that data is very important uh, to, the, to the end result. So, so you can see here that we can collect some, we can make some training set out of data that we have, but if the training set is small or not uh, prepared correctly, then your neural network can achieve on training 100%. So completely classify everything correctly. But the actual function that it is approximating, it's completely different than the, the function that you want to achieve. And that's, for example, Sachin, you today presented something. You said that you have 100% correct on a, on a training, but 
um, my guess is that because you have a small amount of data, you are dying, uh, you are doing good on training, but probably you will do bad on ge on generalization on. Uh, yeah, I have, a, I have a question about that because this this is an interesting point. And, and uh, Pete Warden was uh, mentioning that you need to get like thousands of examples, and I and I I can get what he was saying that if you want to get a range of everyone's let's say it was like their EOGs or something like that. Um, but for tiny ML, I think you, your example that you just showed with the, uh, with, with how you're picking those data points that maybe you're clustering on a single person, but if you're making a tiny ML for a, a single person, does that mean we, we can get away with less data because the variance will just be from one person, a larger array? Yeah, you, you can look at, for example, at this graph, for example, uh, this is, for example, we are talking about our toy example, age, and this is heart rate. And you, for example, collected uh, low heart rate for um, old people, <laughs> you can see here, and you, because you didn't want to torture old people, you collected high heart rate from the younger people. And then you think that you have you have old people, you have young people, you have high heart rate, you have low heart rate, you have everything. But you don't have everything. You have to you have to cover. You think, if I look at that at just the lower left, we nailed it, man. We got it, hundred percent. Yeah, and but I can see yeah. looking at the top one that yeah. it's wrong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. exactly, exactly. So that's why edge cases are very important because then you squeeze that neural network, and it must cut through that space, input space in a correct way. If you, you, can, you can have much less data than the perfect data set, but if you have good edge cases, you can squeeze it and you can force it to go in a direction that you want. That's why, so in the, all of these examples, we don't have edge cases and that's an issue. That's the main issue. Can you define what an edge case is in that graph you just showed? Like, what, what do you mean by edge cases here? The edge cases is basically mathematically defined. If you have input space, that those are the cases where they are clo uh, the, the cases, the examples of one class that are very similar to another class. That's the point. So you're on the edge of the line. You want to yeah, maximize the number or where the decision yeah, point yeah. is. I see. So if you, yeah, if you, classify between blink and uh, I don't know, actual the noise, then the electrode noise that's close to blink, but it's not actually blink. It looks like blink. That, that's, uh, that's a good edge case. So something that's from one class. So, not it, so all the ones and zeros like that are lined class. up across that big line are edge cases. Yes. And then yes, exactly. the more you add, the more that line will move. And then yeah, the, the more you will force the neural network to choose the solution that you want, basically, because neural network will choose any solution. So it will drive through that error space, slide down, and maybe end up who knows where. So if all of these cases have hundred, I see. So uh, so you have edge cases. You always have edge cases, but you get more of them the more you collect data. I got you. Yeah, or you can design the experiments to collect edge cases. So you can. F you can try to, to, to make uh, noise actuals. You can try to do different things to collect edge cases. And uh, I mean, that, that's something, this is explaining principle, but every problem has a different, I mean, it's a, it's a different problem. So we have different input space. So we can discuss about how to collect those edge cases. But the, the main point here is that you remember that you need edge cases for the for your for your project i have a if question you, on that as well if it's yes, okay. please please, please, um, please. I, i'm just thinking about my project and and how i may go about trying to find edge cases in terms of like the readiness potential or something like that um and what i'm seeing here is it seems like these edge cases are easy to see because we're already trying to classify on this and we can tell which ones end up being classified um or they're so they're the cases where they're both close to the line, that would be something with a low confidence, right? Yeah. I'm wondering how I would go about finding edge cases before I start doing classification, like start thinking about them before I'm actually doing the classification. Yes, so the, the first thing that you need to do is to figure out how, uh, how you will determine which 
which signal that just rises. So people don't know your project, but uh, no, no, no. you have to determine uh, how how you will figure out which signal that just rises is actually readiness potential, which is not. So so and then try to collect bunch of data, and then uh, you can even you can even try to. To, to make some kind of uh, measurement of the distance between your data examples. So you, it can be classical Euclidean distance, or it can be some different distance. And then uh, mark, uh, uh, then, then actually calculate distance for each non, uh, uh, non readiness potential data that you have. And and calculate this is for each non uh, readiness potential data that you have from the average of the readiness potential, for example. And the closer they are to the average of the of the readiness potential, then they are they are more edge cases. I don't know how to explain it, but people okay, are not understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let, Just add more that. data is what you're saying, I think. Yes, right. exactly. Okay. Anyway, anyway, sorry about that. Uh, go ahead. Yes. Uh, so you were mentioning how you use you use like a line, a linear plane or a line to distinguish between. Oh, oh, I, that was my question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the, the, uh, I was gonna ask how you would be able to like distinguish between a non-linear classification between like uh, an, uh, a one or a zero, like what you're showing right now. So maybe never mind. I think that was perfect timing for the question. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah sure, I, I will talk more about input space, and then we will later. Yeah, um, we will have, we will later have questions for all, all different kinds of questions. So, if you have more complicated space like this that cannot be linearly uh, discriminated, then uh, you can you cannot use one neuron, of course, but you can use multiple multiple neurons to make a fence around your cluster in that input space. And for example, here we have three input neurons, and each of those neurons are cutting through the space with one line. And you can make a uh, function of those neurons such that, for example, this neuron uh, is corresponding to this line, and it will be active when, when there is a data point on this side of the line. And then this neuron is corresponding to this line, and it will be active when you have data point on this side of the line, etc. And then you have you can have another neuron in the second layer that says if all of those three are active, then uh, we have uh, the, the output of this neuron will be active, and that's how you can combine these these simple neurons that can cut through the space in a simple way and divide it in two parts and combine them and make a fence around your. Or, or around your cluster that you want to classify. That's simple demonstration of how a multi-layer neural network can work. So, but uh, let's let's talk a little bit about time series. So we we in back your brains we are doing a lot of with EEG, EMG, EKG, and the question is how we can use neural network with the time series. So let's define a uh, problem. So we have some signal that has some bumps on it, like EG, AKG. So, and we sample it, we have array of numbers coming, and uh, we have one neural network that has window or three samples, it just, it looks just three samples, current three samples in that signal. And we can start to slide that signal uh, and push inside the neural network one by one. So. For example, let's see how these neural networks uh, see that signal. So, if we have three inputs, we have three dimensions of the of the input space. And for example, here the value of the signal on input x two is high, and on x one and x three is low, which means that uh, the actual data point in this simple space ends up here, up there. If we slide this, then the x3 will be high, and x2 will be lower, and x1 will be lower, and uh, the data point jumps around this space and lets up, uh, lands up 
uh, here near the X3 axis. If we do that more and more, you will see that this actually data point is jumping all around this space. And for basically zero signal, it will end up in a in a in a origin of this of this graph. So, and uh, the question is, how uh, what we will end up when we present this signal uh, uh, to, to a neural network? So we will end up with the multiple clusters in the in the input space, and. If we want to, for example, to recognize uh, this uh, this bump and to detect this bump in a signal, like many of you uh, fellows have this similar kind of problem, like detect blinks or detect the movement of the finger. And then if we just feed in this whole signal to neural network and say, this is your training set, like we are doing at Edge Impulse, then uh, the neural network will generate a bunch of clusters. Some of them are related to the, to the actual thing that we want to classify as some of them are not. Some of them are, will be just noise in between the, 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 the actual useful signal that we are aiming at. And uh, the, in this case, for example, it would be cool if we can just react on on this cluster here and not on other clusters. So we cannot just feed whole this signal to neural network and say this is your this is your class, this is your category that you need to recognize because this signal has multiple parts that are not actually the things that we are interested in, and you will end up with a network that will recognize even noise. Uh, as a useful category, and then when you have when you need to discriminate between two categories, then for example, if we, if another signal appears with this similar kind of noise, your neural network will say, "Oh, that that's a bump that we want to recognize." And then one way to solve that is to actually trigger the the signal and react and feed data only when signals. Uh, has significant power or achieves uh, uh, certain conditions, and then to use only only those examples uh, to to train a neural network, and then we will insulate that cluster, uh, interesting cluster in the input space, and then neural network can go around it and uh, make a fence around it and detect it. So. That, that's one point, but uh, let's also the, the the striking example of that is actually EMG. So if we have EMG and we if we feed the raw EMG to the neural network, so EMG is very high frequency signal. So in one case, some of these peaks will end up on some dimension, but if you and some of the troughs will, will end up on another dimension. But if you move it just for a little bit, then the all input will change and your, your, your actual data point will jump in input space completely a random, completely different uh, place. So these two signals, even though they are very similar to us, are completely different to neural network because they end up uh, peaks land up on different inputs of neural network, different dimension of the input space, and they are completely at a different part of the input space. So what's the solution for that? The solution for that is pre-processing. So even though these signals are different for neural network because they are, uh, they are, they have diff high values on different dimensions, for example, input dimensions, input, uh, inputs of neural network, if you do spectrum, spectral analysis of this signal, the spectrum is completely the same. Because if you do FFT, FFT has spectrum and uh, and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, part of the that complex number that says how much the, the each of frequencies shifted in a, in a time, and we trash that part. That's called phase. And we use just spectrum, and the spectrum uh, will be the same 
if you, however you move this uh, this uh, signal on on your inputs. So the solution to that is to just to do, for example, spectrum and to feed spectrum and get neural network to recognize spectrum and not actual signal. Another way, another thing that you can use are other invariant features, like for example, standard deviation of this signal and this signal is the same, even though they are moved. RMS, total RMS is the same, mean is the same, max is the same, Mi minimum is the same. Number of zero crossing, how many times this signal crosses the, the zero line is the same for this one and this one. I mean, very similar. Spectral centroid, and there are lists and lists of this, uh, these invariant features, especially developed by the people who are uh, processing audio signal, um, audio signal processing, and there are a bunch of papers and bunch of uh, uh, features that you can extract that you can find in the papers that you can extract from the, this kind of signal. We can steal from audio guys. And the good good thing about these features uh, and preprocessing is that you no longer need to have need to feed the uh, original data, raw data, which has huge amount of the samples, and you need huge amount of inputs. But you are a limited number of inputs on like ten or fifteen. And then the error space will be much simpler, and then input space will be much simpler for a neural network, and then neural networks will be uh, much easier to find a solution in that input space. So the notorious for uh, the notorious problem for 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 uh, for for shifting uh, issue is the image. So that image is very complicated uh, problem for a neural network old neural networks, because you can you can see that one image, for example, 200 pixel by 200 pixel, will have 40,000 pixels in it, if it is grayscale, if it is color image, it will be three times more. And you can take each and every pixel from this image and put it in one big array, and you can feed it in neural network this will be neural network with 40,000 inputs. And neural network can maybe learn how to recognize this particular image. But if you move it just for one pixel, left or right, it will completely change all the inputs of the, of the neural network. Uh, if you zoom in, zoom out, of course, if you change the image of the cat, it will completely change. But something that's it's exactly the same to us, like the, the image that, that's moved for one pixel. It's very easy for us to recognize it's the same image. For neural networks, it's completely different image. It's completely different point in the input space, far away from the original image. And the solution for that problem was not found in a classical neural network, a dense neural network, but it was found with a convolutional neural network. Uh, the new kind neural network. I think that the first paper was 1998 that was published. So, what's the what's the coercion neural network? What kind of neurons uh, coercion neural network use? So, the coercion neuron is exactly the same as the old, for example, RAL neuron. It's completely the same. So, there is no difference there. But what's different? Different is that convolutional neural networks are much bigger usually. They are more complicated in a structure, but they use more or less similar neurons and have some additional uh, additional layers. So, in convolutional neural network, you can see something that's called convolutional layer and something that's called pooling layer. Typically, there are other types of layer, but they are most uh, frequently used. And original convolutional neural network had that. And then you have you have series of convolutional and pooling layers, and then at the end you have standard normal neural network. And what what's the point of this uh, convolutional neural network? So the 
We, and the output, we have old-fashioned neural network. The neural network that we were talking about right now, they have problem if you move the image just for one pixel. But uh, these convolutional layers and pooling layers uh, will give us pre-processing such that uh, the output of these, these last pooling layers or last convolutional pooling layers uh, will be completely the same if you just move this image by one pixel, two pixels, it will, uh, it will give us the same output so that this dense neural network or the, the, the function of these convolutional layers will be invariant to the shift and zooming in of the, of the, of the picture. And then we can use old fashioned neural network to just classify on these, uh, on these inputs. So how, how is that, uh, how the convolution neural network is working? So in convolution neural network, you have small number of neurons, but you are using them in a different way. So you're, you're taking one neuron, one neuron that has, for example, nine weights, and you're shifting around the image, the, that neuron, and multiply the weights with the, with the actual input or the actual image. So the function is completely the same. You have inputs, which is image, pixel of image, and you have weights, and you just multiply them, and you calculate that sum that we were talking about, uh, previously, and you output that. But you are do, you are taking one neuron, one set of weights, and you're shifting around the image and calculating the output for each part of the image. And you can have ten different neurons, for example, in a in a in a first convolutional layer, and it will generate ten different output matrix that's actually a result of convolution or multiplying the weights with the image. What do we do next? So if we uh, think about convolutional, uh, lay, uh, convolutional neural networks and try to figure out what's intuition behind it. So the convolutional layer should be, um, it was designed to be kind of detectors for certain features in the image. Uh, because we don't look at the images like array of pixels, like neural network is doing, but humans are detecting edges, detecting, uh, then combining those edges in a visual cortex to the more complicated uh, structures or shapes and then detecting those shapes in the image, then, then maybe detecting and some uh, higher uh, part of the visual pathway, it, it will detect like eyes or ears or, or more complex structure. And uh, the same idea is here, to use the collusion layer as a detectors of certain features, and then to use pooling layer that will basically use output of the commercial detectors, the commercial layer of detectors, and ask and um, check certain area of the image and ask, did you that did anyone in this area detected the certain feature? So it will take the output of the commercial layer and go and and take uh, the, the areas of that output and check for the maximum value in that area. That maximum value, if, if some of the neurons detected certain feature and it has high output, then we'll, we'll pass that output to the next layer. Basically, we will ask the question, is there anybody here that detected the uh, eyes? Is that anybody in this area, another area that detected eyes? So that when you move your picture, for a little bit, uh, the, you will get the same output because the pooling layer will compress that information from wider area. And you can, you can change those convolution and pooling layers and, and, and slowly compress image and detect features, more and more complex features, and end up as a, 
as a, you will get a feature set that's invariant to the shift of the images, zooming in, small zooming in, zooming out, and those kind of transformation. And then you will present that features to dense neural network. So I have a uh, question, Sam. Yes, yeah, uh, please, Sam. Does that mean that um, for feature detection, just in general, um, you can think of all, you'll always have a convolutional layer that's feeding into a pooling layer? And like so, like when we're talking about lines, you would have one set of those two. When we're talking about then uh, you can. lines together. Yeah, you, you can. But in our in our, in our case, uh, you can use convolution layers, and convolution layers are more and more frequently used. So, but if you okay. want to have a simple solution for uh, that will run on microcontroller, you cannot go wild. With the <laughs> with many commercial layers, pulling layers, processing inside. <laughs> so uh, you will try. In our case, we we, we try to to squeeze that processing in a small microcontroller that has that has a uh, small processor. So then we will not go wild with a with a huge amount of commercial layers, etc. So, but uh, yes, commercial layers are very powerful. The, the deep neural network commercial network is very powerful, more powerful than the old. And the, uh, the inputs are some kind of uh, universal pre-processing. But of course, if you have a good idea of how to pre-process data, uh, for example, if you want to do uh, FFT, that's a very powerful tool. And you will not rely on convolution layer to do FFT. So you will not feed the raw data and then rely the convolution layer will do FFT. You will first do FFT, make an image of that, for example, for a spectrogram, and then you will feed spectrogram to the convolutional layer. That, that's how you will do it. Because there are certain pre-processing techniques like FFT, like uh, spectrogram, that are very powerful and we have mathematics for them. And we know how to do them uh, easily. And uh, you will sit, if you know that that's important piece of information, you will do that first and then use convolutional layers after that. And uh, with that, I'm close to ending and I'm open for questions if, if there are any questions. And I want to thank you for listening to me. <laughs> yeah, uh, Chris, go ahead. You've got a, uh, you got a question. Yes. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Yes. yes. All right, good. Um, so about that last point, um, when to use something like a convolutional neural network as pre-processing and when to use features, the problem is that, that we sometimes don't know which, which features to use or which features to pick. Um, exactly. And, yeah. and so, so is there, uh, is, uh, is, it, is, it, is it not the case that a neural network could, in principle, learn to do something like FFT or, or, or in, in principle, detect any feature? Is there, is there any way to uh, run a neural network first, see what features it detects in terms of pre-processing, and then maybe implement those in a mathematical way? Does that happen? Because it's, yeah. it's also, uh, because my example is, if I want to do image processing, I there is AlexNet. There, there are there are pre-made networks that I can download, and they are super powerful. Um, but even when it comes to something like word processing, there's I I couldn't find like a, a, a something like AlexNet, a, a pre-configured network for audio processing. It just doesn't exist, and so I have to start from the beginning with with the FFT and all that. Uh, how how yeah. do we navigate that space? Yeah. So if you have, for example, if you are doing um, general image recognition. So, if you do, uh, if you use convolution neural network on a large data set, uh, you will probably first layer of your uh, different or uh, large data set of different images, people, cars, etc. So, everything that we see around, you will probably end up first layer or convolution layer will will be something similar to the neurons in the primary visual cortex. It will be some kind of similar to wavelets or actually similar to GABA filters. So you will end up with something like that. And then you can decide, okay, I can switch to GABA filters and filter myself. And that's okay. I mean, that's okay. But the later, right. later convolutional layers, as you go deeper and deeper, 
will be more complicated and it will be so it will be hard to figure out what are they actually <laughs> yeah it will be very hard to figure out what are they actually and why are they optimal and we don't have uh, those kind of uh, mathematical yeah processing that, that's suited just for that particular purpose and mm -hmm. uh you can you can do that in principle but only for in my opinion for first layers of evolution Social layer. For later, it's very complicated. It's very uh, ad hoc for sp for special uh, sp special tasks. So, yeah. So I would leave everything else to the coalition neural network. And yeah, I, I hope this answers to your question. This is answer to your question. Yeah, yeah. Please, if you have something else, so please. Does anybody else has? Any other question? I can keep I going. I'm just thinking in. Oops. Please, please, <laughs> please, 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 um, Yeah, so usually when we try to extract these features such as RMS uh, or, you know, all, all those other features, we take some windows of data and then collapse them into smaller versions of, of that time series. So. Uh, I guess my question is, aren't we losing some information the moment we compress the data in that way? Um, yes, of course. You, you're losing a lot of information, but uh, you're, uh, you're hoping that the, you're left with en enough information to do classification. Because you're doing trade-off, you're simplifying input space, which uh, then will then your neural network will need less neurons or, or the error function will be simpler, etc. You're simplifying your input space, but you're losing information. So that's why, so you all, you, and you're doing that consciously. I mean, you know that, for example, if you use a principal component analysis to lower the dimension of the input, you uh, consciously just discard some portion of the of the information and you choose for example first three principal component analysis uh, so uh, vectors and you're doing that all the time yes but you just hope that you will end up with enough information if that answers your question thank you i i have a question just um i think you did a beautiful job explaining the convolution and i get how if you, if you, let's say a picture of a cat was mm -hmm. convoluted around the screen that you could make a feature map of where the cat's face was on the thing and then you can use that to classify uh, various things about maybe the position of the cat and some other mm -hmm. stuff. But what has never been clear to me is how does back propagation in these deep neural networks find the cat like how, how do you actually build how do you learn from data those features is that is that is that part of the the I, I would try, I, 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 no no I would try is, to, is that well known i would try to explain it so i, I don't know if i will manage but i will try to explain it so and if it's, so if first, it's too deep then we can no no, no 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 so the, the, but a few points that are important first of all this neural network with uh, has much less neurons than you would use in in a normal neural network to classify image so it has only for example 10 neurons in the input and 20 neurons in the second is a second stage in, in a, if you would use dense network you will have to cover whole space of the image with a bunch of neurons and uh, because of that the 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 function, the error function is much simpler than the, the job that training needs to do is much simpler because you have 10 neurons and uh, each neuron has a certain amount of uh, number of weights and you're recycling neurons and you're using them on the whole, whole uh, image. That's the first advantage of the coercion neural network. Much less neuron, simpler problem. The second thing is how it will uh, the question is how will neuron converge to something that recognizes let's say i and other neuron will converge to something that recognizes uh, lip 
or lips or corner of the mouth. So that, that's a question. But uh, you have to know that all those neurons are starting with random weights. So they already have some kind of preference. So some will, uh, some will uh, react more on lips than others. And some will react more on eyes than others, basically. I'm now yeah, simplifying it. First stage will detect just edges, and then second stage will I see. Detect. And then and then, and then the sled, and then, they're gonna find And then you, you have feeding feeding data, feeding data. And if you're feeding data of different different cats, so uh, everything will be different except the important feature of the cat, I which see. is which is ears, eyes, whiskers, etc. And then those neurons will will, will specialize in in uh, basically be, because they're predetermined by the random weights, their preference. They will specialize in recognizing those things that statistically appear all the time and the background, cars, grass, etc. There will be no neuron. There will be not. It won't be useful for a neuron to specialize for that. Yeah, and that's. I hope I I somehow you did. I think uh, the the, the, ra the randomness beginning and then just keep doing that 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 uh, gradient descent kind of makes sense mm -hmm. now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. So, well, I think we're out of time. Um, okay, for no. those who have joined late, uh, we are going to post this uh, this entire lecture onto uh, YouTube, so you'll be able to watch it. We've been recording it, and so it'll be up there. Uh, probably in about an hour. So thank you guys. And we will uh, speak with you guys next week. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Thank you, Stan. Thank you, Stan. It was really good. That was awesome. Bye.